Hello, I'm Lucy Miller and I'm with the Virginia Commonwealth University National Training Center. Today's webcast will provide an overview of the Social Security benefits provided to transition-aged youth. A lot of you teachers are probably wondering, why do I even need to know this? Aren't there experts out there who deal with the benefits? Don't they deal with all this? What does this have to do with me? Well, believe it or not, this really is something that would be important for you to have a basic understanding of. No one expects you to become a disability benefits expert, but if you could have a basic awareness of what the benefit programs are, what the basic eligibility requirements are, and certainly how those benefits are affected by work, that would be of tremendous assistance to your students and their families. First of all, teachers are often asked to provide information about students when they are actually applying for some of the disability benefits. Your input can make or break that disability application, so it's important for you to understand a little bit about how those determinations are made. Secondly, you are probably the closest disability professional to that student and their family they're going to come to you with those basic questions about how do these benefits work? How come my check is this amount and not this amount? Again, we don't expect you to be an expert, but if you can answer some very basic questions or point the student and their family to other professionals that can provide more detailed information, that would be tremendously helpful. Finally, I don't think teachers think about the fact that the disability benefits provided by Social Security provide a very important way to successfully transition from student to adult life. Think about the fact that these provide a basic monthly check that can help sustain a student and in some cases the entire family until work can be obtained. Secondly, these benefits come in most cases with health insurance. Medicaid comes with the SSI program and Medicare with some of the other disability benefits. These are critically important building blocks for a successful adult life. So helping beneficiaries manage their benefits, helping students get on the benefits to begin with are very important parts of your job and we hope that you can help. So what are the benefits available to transition aged youth? And it's not just one thing. Um, I think most teachers would be very surprised to know that there are three very, very different benefit programs available to young people. Two of them actually relate to being disabled or having an impairment. One of them has nothing to do with the child or student being disabled at all. So here's the common ones, and I've listed them in the order where most common to least common. The most common benefit you will find is what's called Supplemental Security Income, or SSI. And this is a benefit available to individuals with significant disabilities who meet certain very stringent income and resource restrictions. Um, a lot of teachers don't realize that SSI is available from birth onward. There is no lower age limit. A child of any age can apply and be awarded um, these benefits if they meet the requirements. Um, secondly, child's benefits. Social Security also sometimes calls these dependent child's benefits and there's a lot of confusion around this type of benefit because it isn't related to disability at all. It is simply a benefit that's afforded to minor children of former workers who now have insured status and they're either deceased, retired and collecting Social Security, or disabled and collecting Social Security. So it's an important benefit that many students, not just students with disabilities, many students receive because of a parent's death or um, disability or retirement. Finally, the least common is a group of benefits known uh, through the Title II of the Social Security Act. Often people refer to all of these benefits collectively as SSDI or Social Security Disability Insurance. Um, actually, under that category of, of disability benefits, there are several different types. Um, SSDI is one type when you are collecting off of your own work record. And the more common type for children that you might be serving would be childhood disability benefits. We'll go over each of these in a little bit more detail later. 
Now, something really important to understand, and this comes as, as quite a shock, certainly to parents and lots of times to teachers, is that in the United States, many children with profound disabilities are not found eligible for any type of benefit available through the Social Security Administration at all. Um, each of the three benefits listed here has very specific eligibility criterion, and many children don't meet the criterion for any of these benefits. They are not afforded a cash payment and are uh, then not afforded coverage like Medicaid either. And uh, that's something that a lot of people really don't understand. There's no guarantee of a benefit even if you have a child with a profound or seriously significant disability. So let's start with the most common, and, and this is everyone's favorite, Supplemental Security Income, SSI. And one of the things that I think teachers need to understand is that SSI truly is a form of federal welfare. Now, you don't really want to talk to parents about that because that word is pretty charged, and middle-class families in particular, um, it offends them a little bit when you say that their children are receiving a federal form of welfare, but in fact, they are. The SSI program is not funded with the money that comes out of the Social Security Trust Fund. You know, the money that comes out of your paycheck every week when you get your paycheck that goes into Social Security, that is not what funds the SSI program. Mm -hmm. Federal tax dollars, the lovely check we all write on April 15th, um, at least that I write on April 15th, that is what funds the SSI program. Um, and when we had the big welfare reform back in the mid-90s, the SSI program was significantly impacted by that legislation. Well, what is this program? It provides a minimum monthly cash payment, and boy is it minimum, well, I'll tell you how much that is this year, and Medicaid in most cases to eligible aged, and they define aged as 65 and older, um, blind, and there's a whole distinction in the Social Security land between being blind and being disabled, and individuals obviously with a severe disability. Now when I say a minimum payment, it really is minimum. The maximum that you can receive in federal SSI this year, 2014, is $721. And that is assuming there is no other form of income that would count to reduce that payment. So we're a maximum of 721. Now to, uh, to be found eligible for SSI, the student has to meet very strict income and resource limits. These are the strictest limits of any um, means-tested program operated by the federal government in this country. For students under the age of 18, parental income and resources count as well. And it is, again, very strict. This is why you see so many children who have very significant disabilities not qualifying. It isn't that they aren't disabled. It's that this is the most prevalent program available and the parental income or resources is too high. Um, and that, that is the, the first thing they check. So before they even assess your disability, if you don't meet the income guidelines, you don't make it forward in this program. Now, um, once you've met the income and resource guidelines, Social Security does a very stringent medical review of the student's disability. And one of the things teachers don't understand is that Social Security kind of operates in a very insulated world, and their definitions of disability often don't match anyone else's. So just because a student has qualified for special education services in your system does not mean that that student is automatically going to meet the medical definition of disability um, in the SSI program. Um, something else to understand that just makes it even more complicated, in the SSI program, there are two different definitions of disability, one for children and one for adults. The childhood definition is must, much less stringent than the adult definition. So while it might be easier to be found eligible for SSI as a child, it is not easy as an adult. And many children who qualify for SSI fail to qualify as an adult when they turn 18. Um, and that can be quite a rude awakening for students and their families. Well, what about this child's benefits? And this is the second most common uh, type of payment that children are receiving that teachers might be working with. 
And this was a benefit program created years ago when Social Security was first passed into law, um, back in the days of, of our beloved Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And this is part of the old Widows and Orphans program, if you can believe that. In the old days, there was a notion that if a parent died or became disabled or was elderly, that there would be an economic impact on any dependent children. That makes a lot of sense. So the original Social Security program provided additional payments for children, minor children, of former workers who had worked enough and paid enough into the system to establish what Social Security calls insured status, and it allows that individual's minor children to collect a payment. It does not decrease the payment that the adult receives, um, but it is an additional payment. And the way that it works in Social Security land is there's a total family maximum. So if I have, let's say that maximum is $500. If I have 10 kids and they're all minors, they're going to get, you know, um, 50 bucks a piece. If I have one kid, that kid's going to get the total 500 and that's how it works. Um, child's benefits are not related to disability in any way. Now, the child receiving them may happen to have a disability, but these benefits, there is no medical review, there's no income or resource review, this is not a welfare program, it's insurance, and it is simply an additional payment provided to dependent children of former workers who are now deceased, retired and collecting Social Security, or disabled and collecting Social Security. Um, it's a lot more common than you would think. Now, how long can children receive these? The maximum age for your, for your students who you're serving would be 19 years and two months. Do not ask me why they tacked the two months on there. I have no idea. 19 years and two months, as long as that child remains in secondary school. You cannot graduate from high school at the age of 19 and go on to VOTEC or college and have these benefits continue. They are only provided to a maximum age of 19 years and two months as long as you are still in school. Now, what if I turn 18 in April and I drop out of high school? Your benefits will stop. You get them up to the age of 18 and beyond if you remain in school. This is an, an interesting dropout prevention incentive that the students and teachers need to know about. Um, the bad news about child's benefits is while the SSI program comes with Medicaid, child's benefits afford no health insurance whatsoever. You do not get Medicare on this benefit. There's no automatic conduit for Medicaid eligibility either, but it does provide an additional cash payment, which can be very beneficial to families. Well, what's the deal with these Title II disability benefits? What a lot of people just refer to sort of globally as SSDI. Well, these were benefits created um, in the 50s. Uh, they weren't part of the original benefit package that um, Roosevelt enacted into law in the 30s. These came along later. And there are a couple of different ways to qualify for this type of disability benefit. It provides a monthly cash payment and the nice thing about these benefits, if you qualify, there's none of this maximum of $721. There is a maximum, but it's close to $3,000 a month. So these programs do offer much higher cash payments, but it all depends on the work record of the person that the benefit is being drawn off of. So if you worked all your life and you had a high paying job, you're gonna be afforded a much higher cash payment than someone who worked very minimally and earned very low wages. The amount of the check really depends on the insured worker's work history. Now these benefits are disability benefits. So there is a medical review. It's a very stringent standard. These benefits only have one definition of disability and it is the adult definition. Um, these are not easy to qualify for and again how Social Security defines disability often doesn't match anyone else's definition and it often seems quite illogical so it's just something that you have to be aware of. Now to qualify for one of these benefits you have to have a work record to draw off of. Um, the best way I can describe this, this is like insurance. If you ever have, and you may have through your school, a disability um, policy 
you're paying a monthly premium for that, and if something happened to you, you got hit by a bus, you, you know, became ill, you had to not work, then you're able to collect insurance because you paid your premium. These programs are exactly like that. You're paying a premium out of every paycheck. It's called FICA. It goes into the Social Security Trust Fund, and it's there for you in case you become ill or injured and are unable to work. And most people don't realize, but a parent can actually share their insured status with a child. So the two most common ways that your students may collect a benefit through Title II disability programs is SSDI, and that's the one everybody thinks the whole program is, but it isn't, and then childhood disability benefits. So let's look at a comparison. Um, both of these programs are forms of insurance. Both of these programs are paid for out of the Social Security Trust Fund. When you get SSDI, you are drawing a benefit on your own work record. So you worked, you paid your FICA, you became ill or injured, you filed a claim, you met the disability standard, and you draw a monthly benefit um, of whatever amount based on the contributions you made, the premiums you paid. A lot of people think students can't get this. There is no lower age limit to the SSDI program. The reason most students don't get this, they haven't worked enough. They don't have long work histories. They've worked very sporadically or, or not at all. So when Social Security looks at the application and they process all the work records that are available to be drawn off of, the student doesn't have enough work to generate a benefit off of his or her own work record. Um, again, in that program, the benefit amount is based on however much you paid into the system. It involves a five-month waiting period before checks can begin. And here's a really bad thing. It doesn't bring you Medicare until you have been eligible for two years. A lot of people think that if they can qualify for disability, they immediately get Medicare. That's not true. Two-year waiting period, which is quite painful. Now, the good news is this is not a welfare program. It's not means tested. Working affects it, your ability to work and your past work, but no one cares how much you have in the bank or how much unearned income you get. That's not relevant. So what about CDB? What's that? Childhood disability benefits is a benefit paid off of a work record of a parent. Now, the only way to invade the work record of a parent is after the parent has already started to tap their insurance themselves. The only way they can do that is by dying, by becoming disabled and becoming eligible for Social Security disability, or by retiring. And remember, our retirement age, the earliest is 62, and retiring and collecting Social Security. And literally what that parent is doing is sharing their insured status with a, depend with a minor child or a child with a severe disability. Now, CDB benefits are disability related, so the student must apply, must go through that medical review, and must have met the adult definition of disability in the Social Security program. Now, one of the things that is not listed on, on this slide, um, we do cover it in the webcast on eligibility, but is something for you to know is that CDB benefits, I know it's called childhood disability benefits, but you can't get them until you are 18. I know that doesn't make any sense, but they are not available until the child has turned 18. Um, it too involves a 24 month waiting period for Medicare, which is unfortunate. The good news again, no limit on resources, no limit on unearned income. Well, that's the quick and dirty over the three types of benefits that transition-aged youth are likely to get. And boy, I have given you the Reader's Digest totally condensed version. Um, so you know enough about to make it a little bit dangerous. So where do you go to get help? There is help for you. There are four different sources of information just here in the state of Virginia that should be able to offer you enough information to answer any questions that your students would have or that you might have. The first is the Work Incentives Planning and Assistance Program, and I'll explain what that is in a minute. It's a program that's available all over the United States, fully funded by the Social Security Administration, and that's the program that my team at VCU is affiliated with. 
you're very lucky in the state of Virginia that your Department of Aging and Rehabilitation Services, I understand that um, affectionately known as DARS, your DARS values benefits counseling and they offer payment for that service in your state and I'll cover that in a little bit more as well. You also have your Center on Transition Innovations and this webcast is part of that wonderful center and there is just a ton of information available on their website for you to gain more understanding of the Social Security benefits for transition age youth. And finally, the Social Security Administration offers just amazing wealth of information on their website and although it is complex and their programs are difficult, their website is very easy to navigate and the amount of information available is amazing. It really is. All right, let's dig in. What is this WIPA program? What is that? This is that Work Incentives Planning and Assistance. It's fully funded by the Social Security Administration and it is a national initiative. There is no county and no state that doesn't have WIPA. There are WIPA services available everywhere. Now on the CTI website there is information about where you should go in the state of Virginia to get WIPA services. There are two agencies that receive funding from Social Security to do benefits counseling for individuals who receive Social Security disability benefits. And those two agencies split the state of Virginia and on the CTI website you can click on each of the agencies and it will tell you which counties are served by which agencies. And as I recall, it even tells you which staff person serves certain counties with their contact information. If you have not met your WIPA provider, immediately after this webcast, you need to get on the phone, on your computer, email, make some introductions. These are valuable contacts for all teachers um, to have because they're a wealth of information and they can provide direct services to your students. Now, they are limited in what they can do. They're funded by Social Security, and Social Security is a pretty demanding taskmaster. The purpose of the WIPA programs is to help beneficiaries make informed choices about work. So if you have a student who is planning on working, that is an appropriate referral to your local WIPA program. If you have a student who has no interest in working, no immediate plans to work, um, and they just have a benefit problem or they have questions, you will probably get information and referral services, but they're not going to meet with that student. The WIPAs are all about work. So those students that you're working with who are planning on employment, who have job offers, who are looking for work, those are the folks that you need to get on the phone with the WIPAs about. Well, how do you become eligible for their services? Pretty wide open. At least 14. Okay, at least 14 and you have to already be receiving a Social Security benefit based on disability. Now remember those three benefits that kids get, the one in the middle, child's benefits, that's not a disability benefit. So someone who isn't getting SSI or one of the Title II disability benefits is not going to qualify. Now they're limited in what they can do. They're not allowed to help people apply for benefits and they're not allowed to help or well, really represent students who are in an appeals process. They're either appealing an initial denial for eligibility or they might be appealing um, uh, an overpayment or some kind of problem that's occurred with their benefits. WIPAs can provide information but they can't be your advocate, go with you to the Social Security and represent you in an appeals um, situation. So it is limited. Now the other thing I'm going to warn you about, WIPA is wonderful, but it's limited. I don't know exactly how many of the WIPA personnel you have in the state of Virginia, but it's not enough, I can tell you that. And they really can't meet with every student individually, they can't come to every transition meeting, they can't come to every IEP. Um, it's important for you to meet these folks, but there is a limit to how much personalized information they can provide to every student that you might be working with. Well, where else can you go? Um, what are the other options? As I mentioned, your state vocational rehabilitation agency does provide limited benefits counseling service. 
it's kind of on an a la carte basis for students who already have that open case with DARS you could request certain types of benefits counseling service for example um, you could get what's called a benefits analysis where a qualified benefits counselor analyzes the student's benefits and provides very specific information about how work would affect those benefits. DARS contracts with a variety of very qualified people, um, folks who have been through a lengthy training and certification process um, to offer this fee-for-service benefits counseling. So if it's of interest to you, get together with your local VR DARS counselors, um, find out what they can and cannot provide, and find out who in your area is a vendor for DARS so that you have more options for benefits counseling. All right, what else? Where can you go to learn more? Well, the sky is the limit here. It's all just how crazy are you about the disability benefits and how much do you want to know? We certainly have a lot of information. And if you have um, the desire to become a certified um, benefit specialist, what we call a community partner, that is available to you. You can go to the same training that the WIPA staff people go through. It is rigorous. You can go through the whole certification process and literally become a certified CWIC is what we call them. And that's a Community Work Incentives Coordinator. Social Security allows non-WIPA staff to come to this training. Where do you get it? You get it from us at VCU. That's my team. And here is our website listed on this um, slide. It's the National Training Center for the WIPA Projects. And you can go online. You can look and see where we're offering that training. You can learn about the requirements. What is the agenda? What's the curriculum? And, and you can certainly register for these events. Now, they are limited. Everyone who registers doesn't get in. But if your school system really wants to have an on-site benefits expert, we can train you to be that expert. Um, now, our website offers lots more than that. For those of you with an undying need to know, we have our National WIPA Manual. It's a lovely 800-page manual that we use to train CWICs. We have um, an incredible number of briefing papers, fact sheets, forms, archived trainings that are free. All you have to do is go online and play around on our website and see what's available. It's a little overwhelming, the amount. It's a lot. Um, what else? Cornell University. Our colleagues and dear friends at Cornell really have a lot of expertise in this area. They also offer a certification program. It's all online, no face-to-face -face training. It's a little expensive, but it's definitely a good quality program. And if, again, you really want to have a benefits expert on your team, local, so you don't have to rely on external WIPA folks or DARS uh, fee-for-service, you do have options for developing this expertise. Third, um, my dear friend Michael Walling, who um, has been doing training in benefits counseling for a million years. He's outstanding. He offers shorter online training. So if you want to know more but you don't want to be an expert, you might want to check out Michael Walling's website. He also is available to come to your locale. If you can get a group of people together who want the training and split the cost, it's very affordable. He is a dynamic trainer, very interesting and extremely knowledgeable and could probably customize the presentation um, to meet your needs. But by all means, uh, look at his website. Lots of good free resources there as well. And finally, Social Security. Go online. If you haven't looked at their website, check it out. It is chock full of information, easy to use. Their publications are outstanding. They have a whole communications team sitting in Baltimore who is totally awesome at taking these really complicated regulations, writing them in a way that a lay person can understand. The brochures are free. You can download them online. They're easy to understand. They're written for beneficiaries. So check out everything that's available there as well. So what are some final words? If you've gotten through this presentation and you're starting to sort of have palpitations because this is just really complicated and it's one more thing you need to know, 
I understand, but don't panic. No one expects you to be an expert unless you want to be, unless you want to get trained to be that expert. But we want you to have a basic knowledge, just basic awareness. There are disability benefits, a basic understanding of what it takes to be eligible for them, and a very basic understanding of what happens to those benefits when students go to work, because that's really um, an important aspect. And you really need to know where to refer students for extra assistance. And that's why I'm saying as soon as this webcast is over, get on the phone, get on your computer, meet your local CWIC, remember the Community Work Incentives Coordinator. There is someone assigned to your county and that person is just a wealth of information and can be of tremendous help to you in your job working with students with disabilities. All right, we're done with the, today's webcast. I really appreciate the fact that you've dialed in with us, and we hope that you'll dial in for more. Thanks so much.